So we come to the last part of the Greek philosophies, aptly titled Last Greek Philosophies. All right. So last time we were at Aristotle, right? So after Aristotle died, there wasn't significant achievements in philosophy. So basically, <clears throat> after Aristotle died, the Greek city-states like Athena and Spartan and all those other cities you heard of fell into ruin. Philip II and his son Alexander the Great from Macedonia, which is the northern part of Greece, but not continent part of Greece, they invaded the city-states of Greek and took over and unified those countries. So <clears throat> after that happened, what happened was that most city-states fell into a controlled state by Macedonia. So what Alexander the Great did in his conquest was that he tried to spread the Greek culture. Like he invaded Persia, and you probably heard the story when he ordered his officers to marry Persian woman, high novel woman, of course, so that the culture gets interspread and that gets spread Greek culture. But while this look sounded good when Alexander was alive, it didn't look too well after he died. What happened was that there was an intermix of foreign culture, especially Greece with Persia and India and other Asianic and Middle Eastern countries. And while this sounds good, what happened was that Greece lost most of its intelligence and power and prowess, of course, and filled that gap with religion from the other countries. Religion appealed from other parts of the globe, and then that went into Greece instead of the philosophy and sciences. And other cultures learned the intelligence and things of Greece, but they couldn't advance it because they were not Greek people. So <clears throat> basically, the Greek people began to have a different mindset about the future in general. I'm going to talk about this more later on. Basically, what happened was that in the philosophy world, when Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, this kind of people lived, the focus was on the pursuit of truth and knowledge and old ideals, and oh, well, for Plato at least, and all this kind of stuff, right? And that was the point of philosophy, is to pursue truth, to pursue noble truth. But what happened when religion came in and chaos was subdued and there were just peacefulness and mindlessness was that people began to have different thoughts about the future. It didn't matter if you're pursuing knowledge or if you're pursuing ideals or if you're a philosopher. It was the goal was just to live as simply as that so in the hellenistic world four major philosophies comes in you can see them on the screen cynicism skepticism epicureanism and stoicism epicureanism and stoicism is the most influential ones so i'm going to deal with cynicism and skepticism first but basically these philosophies were not really philosophies pursuit of truth you'll see what i mean when you explain this different version of philosophies so cynicism right <clears throat> basically the the person who made cynicism was Antisthenes, which was a disciple of Socrates. So what he did was that he made unrefined views. Basically, what, what I'm talking about is that he saw everything through an unrefined view of philosophy. He used to be a disciple of Socrates, right? Back in the ages when philosophy was respected and noble. But something happened to him, we don't know exactly what, and he began to hate those noble and novel and distinguished and those philosophical things. He began to appeal to more popular subjects like the crowd, he gave open lectures, and then he did it. But he, well, he was the founder of cynicism, he didn't have that much influence. The person who did have the most influence was a person called Diagnos Diogenes, Diogenes, who, who was also called the cynic. He was called a cynic because the word cynic comes from canon and he lived like a dog. You all know the famous story when he was living in his home and then Alexander, the King Alexander comes and said, do you want anything? And he says, just for you to stay out of my light. Basically, cynicism isn't what you associate with current culture today. If you say cynic in the current society, it means someone who doubts society, right? In the classical cynicism, it's not more about doubting society. The factor is there, but it's more about virtue. It's about how to leave a, live a virtuous life. So his diagnosis, Diogenes and Antisthenes said that the simple life was the best possible life you can live. Think about it. Why would you have all those feasts and all those grand gatherings when a simple bread can satisfy your hunger? Why would you live in a big palace with lots of robes and lots of servants when you could simply satisfy your sleep by sleeping wherever, even under the bridge? So the whole point of cynicism was to live as simply as possible. The part cynic comes from the thought of society. It rebelled against the materialistic society that's been living on by saying that riches, all those kinds of things are pointless, but only the virtue works. So the next branch of the stuff is skepticism. Now, skepticism first sounds like a really good doctrine. It, that, it literally means to doubt everything. The most influential person was called Philo, who was a general in Alexander's army. He was one of the persons who got the Hellenistic world after it had been divided into three. So basically, skepticism is a very... It sounds very good, but it's a very unintelligent subject. Here, here. This is what scientists view. They say things can exist. I'm not sure about it, and that's why I hope to find out. Intelligence, I don't know anything, Socrates, so you hope to find out about it. That's the classical philosophy. But skepticism is that nobody will ever know. Now, this view sounds very novel and very good, but again, it's just appealing to the laziness and culturality of popular culture. 
Again, the book we're dealing with is the history of Western philosophy. So Burton Russell sees skepticism as a very, very low down populist philosophy. It's like, why would you bother pursuing truth when you know that no one can ever know anything? Of course, it sounds like Socrates, but it's more in the fact that per pursuing knowledge and all those kind of is pointless because you'll never get it. Socrates said that we didn't know anything because there were two logical contradictions in his life. So the next influential person was Timon, who was the disciple of Pyro. Up to the time of Pyro, skepticism was a very, very, very unrefined populistic philosophy. It simply said that you shouldn't ever bother to find out about anything because it's pointless, because it's all going to come up in the end. The logical contradiction was, of course, that you know that you can't ever know anything, which is knowledge in itself. If you say you don't, don't know anything, and you define it as A, and you define not know anything as a part of a subset of A, we're going to cover this a lot later on in contemporary philosophy, then it can't possibly make sense. But Timon had a very intelligent, if not somewhat illogical view of deductive logic. He said that for classical logic to happen, which in this case was all deductive logic, there wasn't any inductive. If you look at Euclid's geometry, it's a very good example. But anyways, he said that every deduction must have a beginning, which is called an axiom in geometry and algebra. And he said, these axioms cannot possibly come into being because they can't ever be proven true. If you say all swans that are white f fly south in the winter, then you have to look at all swans that are white and observe each of them to see if they f fly to south to the winter or not. Of course, this is impossible, right? So up to the point of the 17th or the 18th century, this was the biggest argument against the deductive logic. So for skeptics, the biggest problem was of the senses, right? If you don't know anything, then how do you know that this world exists? And how, does, how do you know that this world is made out of materials? So Pyro came up with two very logical statements. He first said this, when I say that the flower smells good, I do not mean that there is actually a flower that is smelling to an existence as me. What I mean to say is that the appearance of that flower is giving an appearance of a very good smell to my apparent senses. So he tried to argue against not knowing anything and apply it to the world by saying that appearances are the most of everything. A modern skeptic would say that you're not actually, it's not appearing to do anything, but it's simply giving the appearance of appearing to do so and ad infinitum. But the point is that he tried to get bypass this and it was somewhat accepted by the contemporary philosophers. He also said, he also made the first deductive logic for sciences. He said, for he talked a lot about atoms. He said, how can you possibly observe atoms, which was impossible back in his days? <clears throat> He believed in the existence of it, but he said that the only way to prove that an atom is, let's say, falling down to the earth at the same time near the same ground is to show phenomenons and see how they happen. If there's two things and those happen at the same time, or if it appears that one causes another, he said that those are a phenomenon. It appears that one causes another, and that's why it that happened. So the thing was that he, he didn't really like the sciences, but we'll get to that later. There's Arcelius, Arcelius is a very good example of a skeptic. He gave lectures in Rome, which appealed to a lot of young popular people. So this was an example when he went to his, let's see, one of his trips in Rome. In one of his lectures, he gave a very edifying, very knowledgeable lecture about Plato and Aristotle and about knowledge and what justice and what virtue is. In his second speech, he decided to go against everything that he says and prove them false. So he wasn't actually saying that Aristotle or Plato or Socrates was false. He was just giving an example of how everything could be doubted, that not everything could be seen as true.